Okay, so what I was saying before is that I was going to try to talk about where I've been recently with my research and where I'm kind of going to. So in that book, Why Race Still Matters, which some of you may have seen, um, what that really was, was bringing together pieces of research, um, pieces of research and, and consequent theorization that I'd been dealing with um, in, the, in the previous years before that. So it wasn't necessarily all new work, but it was, that's okay. Um, it was kind of building on things that I'd already been doing. So what I was writing on there was things like, how do we conceptualize race as something that does something rather than something that is something rather than something that is like your identity? Um, how to think about the historical relationship between race and racism and whether we need to disentangle these things or alternatively, how do they work together? Um, and I was kind of resisting what I found to be the kind of quite pat maxims, like um, things like, you know, race is the child of racism, not the father. Um, and, you know, this idea that, you know, there's always this kind of racist ideology that then drives the creation of a taxonomy of race, which I always found insufficient and so on. I also had a chapter in that book about the problem of what we might want to call the white left dismissal of thinking analytically with race and the need to further theorize uh, the possessive investment in race that exists also on the left. And when I say the white left, I'm also I'm talking about a structural whiteness. I'm not necessarily saying that everybody in this particular iteration of the left is white, okay? Um, and then the last chapter looked at how the politicized attacks on the Zionist manipulation of antisemitism. And I resist the language of the re weaponization of antisemitism, and we might wanna get into that in the end. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take a detour down that route, but I'm quite resistant to that language. But how those politicized attacks crystallize many of the problems inherent in state anti-racism. So we've seen that, right? Especially in the UK, I think, how the state has intervened as being the most anti-racist act actor under the proviso of protecting the Jews in the name of kind of attacking Palestinians and Muslims and so on and so forth, right? Um, in this work, I provided a definition of race as a technology of power. So I wrote about race being a technology of power for the management of human difference uh, with the aim of producing, reproducing, and maintaining white supremacy on a local and a planetary scale. And it's quite interesting and a little bit embarrassing. And I think actually Mustafa is here online and it's, he's, he's the one who's, um, who's responsible for this. I didn't actually realize, and I think it's good to air these things. You know, even if we've been doing this work for a really long time, we don't read everything. Sometimes we miss things, right? And I hadn't actually realized that this uh, definition was actually a mashup of two other pieces of work that I swear to God I did not read before, right? So it's okay. But it also looks really bad that I didn't read it. So, you know, I don't know whether it's a good thing to admit or a bad thing to admit. But if you look at Geraldine Heng's definition of race in her book on um, race in the Middle Ages, um, she stresses the management of human difference as being key to her understanding of race. And then Falcon Shade, whose work was introduced to me by um, Mustafa, she provides a theorization of technology, uh, so race as technology. In my work, I rather refer to Wendy Chun's essay, Race and Stroke as Technology, which is a great essay that I recommend everybody read if you hadn't done already. Um, but, you know, there's an element that's problematic there. So she mobilizes Heidegger's um, reflections on technology as being only understandable as a mechanism for producing an effect. In other words, technology doesn't have any content. It's always doing something. So that really plays into this idea of race being a doing, you know, it's an action word, not a, not a con no, it doesn't have a content in and of itself. So while Chun's work and Shade's work are actually absolutely invaluable, and then I went and read all of Falcon and Shade's wonderful book on the polit political philosophy of race and so on, it's notable that both of them rely on Eurocentric and often racist philosophers like Heidegger, but also others. And I think that begs important epistemic questions for what work we're utilizing in order to th make our own theorization. So, okay, so that's kind of where I come to come from when, you know, in terms of where I stand now. So I published that book three years ago. I guess it was the culmination of work that I'd been doing since the mid 2010s. So it was a, like a long period in which I'd been thinking about all of these questions. And then I was thinking about where to go um, after this. So I'm hoping to sort of trace that trajectory with you over the next little while. So I was actually asked a serious question by Sudeep and he, he asked me, please don't say this um, because he's, he's very humble. Laughing. He's very humble and he didn't want to appear that to be the one who's kind of guided or oriented this conversation. 
but actually they were really useful for me in order to be able to structure this kind of talk. So I hope you don't mind that I do actually refer to your questions in the chat, right? So the first question relates to what I've just been speaking about and it's on definitions of race and whether or not we need them, their utility, okay? And I kind of summarized your questions if you don't mind. So actually previously in all of my writing, I've been quite resistant to defining race. And I'd even been asked by people, what's your definition of race? And I always had some kind of circuitous way of answering the question saying, well, do we really need definitions and so on? And actually, you know, I'm opening a parenthesis here because I do think that question is an important one with my, um, one of my PhD students, um, Kian Aspinall, he's writing on fascism and the black radical tradition. And he actually says, you know, it's actually quite problematic. Like defining fascism is actually quite problematic, especially in the current conjuncture, right? With fascism, we have all of these interminable debates about, well, can we call what's going on today fascism? I mean, is it really fascism? And obviously that really depends on where you stand, right? So if you think fascism can only be confined to a period in the mid 20th century, you're kind of telling us things about what you think is a real political threat and what isn't. And that depends on your standpoint. And hence he brings in the work of people like Du Bois, George Padmore and C.L.R. James to really critique and push back against this because of the kinds of anti-fascist activism that they were all involved in in the 20th century. Having said that, um, sometimes definitions are useful, not least, as he said, to see where people line up. So just as I've just, as I've just been saying, when people define something in a certain way, it kind of tells you what they're about, right? So that's kind of useful when we're trying to think about our work. So while the definition I provided in My Race Still Matters that I just, um, that I just conveyed to you has been useful to me, and I think to others, um, because it's a definition that emphasizes the processual nature of race. So this notion of race is a set of processes that kind of pull uh, from diverse and entangled dynamics. So you've got culture, religion, geography, nations and nationalism, science, colonialism, imperialism, slavery, and so on and so forth. All of this is crucial to race critical thought. So it's always um, you know, complexifying, not simplifying. Um, the emphasis here is on change and adaptability, the chain, change, uh, changing nature and adaptable nature of race against the fixity that race itself is established to create an illusion of, right? So that's important for me in that definition. In setting this up in the book, I referred to Patrick Wolfe's account of race as being inherently unstable and hence in need of constant reformulation. And I also, of course, drew heavily on Stuart Hall's notion of race as a sliding or a floating signifier and the work of articulation that it services in, as he puts it, society, structured and dominance. These are obviously two separate papers that <laughs> kind of bring them together, right? Uh, race can, cannot be thought about in absence of the other organizing narratives, such as, of course, gender, class, and as Sita Balani uh, argues in her new book, Sexuality. The role of the nation however, I think has actually been rather downplayed in more recent work, but it's primary in Cedric Robinson, who I'm shortly going to be talking about, and in his explanation in Black Marxism of how a heron pope nationalism helped to further solidify differentiation as the primary impetus of European civilization from the European feudal era on. And actually thinking about the, roles, the role of nations and nationalism returns us to earlier work, perhaps in the more, should I say, Eurocentric vein. People who I relied on a lot in my PhD, uh, my first book, so somebody like Etienne Balibar in Race, Nation, Class, that classic book, which I actually think we should return to. Um, and, uh, you know, other people as well who I was kind of, um, well, particularly Sigmund Bauman, for example, who I was drawing on a lot at the time. The nation reappears in discussions of what is erroneously, I think, referred to as populism today. So populism rather than fascism, and that's a whole other line that we could open questions about. But here, often the use of the terminology of white nationalism appears almost to be this kind of polite euphemism that's supposed to infer something other than fascism, some kind of new thing, but which is confined to a distinct historical period which is now seen as being over. So that's fascism in the past, white nationalism in the present, which is seen to exist in only certain kinds of movements and cannot be generalized beyond these kinds of extremist movements and so on. Now, of course, work in critical border studies, I think, can't ignore the nation. But sometimes I think that in emphasizing the technocratic nature of the border, the multiplicity of borders and all that kind of work, 
it runs the risk with that body of work runs the risk of failing to relegate the role of um, nationalist ideology in producing and reproducing the need for strong borders and managed migration and so on. It also doesn't, I think, often contend with its own methodological nationalism at times. So I'm a little bit critical of that, um, that some of that work. And I think, um, you know, I've written about this in relation to um, epistemological questions um, elsewhere and the kind of sidelining of race in a lot of kind of critical border studies work. So here I'm reminded of the work of somebody who has written really, really interesting work recently. So Sidan Issar and his colleagues on the primitive accumulation of whiteness, when they ask in whose interests capitalism is reproduced on a global scale. Um, they say that we tend to lose sight of the white European subject as being the beneficiary of this global expansion and the extraction and super exploitation of the world's masses, which it continues to require. So I think that's very interesting to think about, well, the link between whiteness, the nation, race, the border, and all these types of things. And that's where I found the kind of definition that I was advancing to be useful because it emphasized this, the role of technology, the role of race as a doing, which then allows us to see how it necessarily has to build and work together with these other uh, structuring um, constraints. All right, so after um, I published uh, Why Race Still Matters, uh, where did I go? What was I doing? So I published it in 2020. It's a pretty bad time to publish a book. <laughs> as many people will know. So it came out in April 2020, and I couldn't go anywhere because the Australian border was closed for two years, yeah? But, excuse me, paradoxically though, it ended up being quite good because it allowed me to have all these conversations with people. Um, and I'm sure everybody had a similar, you know, we were all stuck at home. What were we going to do? Well, we jumped online and we discussed with all these people and it suddenly became possible in a way that hadn't been strangely, I mean, you know, we could have done it before, but why didn't we do it? And now it's become a fixture of our lives that we tend to have these online meetings with people. And it really kind of opened up a possibility for me to have conversations about the themes emerging from the, from the book with a wide range of people in different locations. And all of these conversations, both formal, so, you know, when people invited me to this kind of event to actually talk about my work and et cetera, but also the informal WhatsApp groups and all the rest of it have kind of led me to where I'm going um, currently. Um, so I've also developed my thinking in preparation for the current book within uh, my teaching and also through the website that Sudeep mentioned, where I work out a lot of my ideas. It's basically when I teach, I tend to write blog posts about the particular readings that we're doing together with the students. And I make links between those readings, my own research and other people's research and try to uh, create all these linkages that I hope people find useful. But it's mainly... I mean, it's like selfishly for me, because I find that I need to kind of tease things out, right? I need to kind of sit and write about things. I, I, I kind of highly recommend that as a methodology for, for kind of uh, working out your ideas. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I'm always involved in a dialogical process or several processes, which I hope people feel is reflected in um, what I write and speak about. Nothing that anybody does really is ever done alone. So the idea of this genius sitting in his or his or her, you know, ivory tower is an absolute nonsense as far as I'm concerned. I was reflecting about this a little while ago when I wrote a blog, short blog post on the phenomenon of what I was calling power plagiarism, which is something that I noted that people had started to do. Maybe they'd always been doing it, but I noted it. So people dipping into your secondary sources, right? So they're not citing you, but they're citing the people who you cite. And then they're putting them out that out as their work. So they're not, I described this in the blog post as not showing you're working out, like you're asked to do when you when you you know, math math teachers ask children to show how they've worked, how they've come to where they've come, right? And I think, you know, there's a there's an aim which is very much pushed by the neoliberal academy to be the first or the only person to advance a certain line of thought. And I think that's extremely negative. So what I'm trying to say is that I think it's really important to show and where, where we're coming from and who we've learned together with and where we're, where our ideas have come from, because they're never out of the brilliance of your own you know, mind. <laughs> it's not true. There are no first ideas, basically. The very idea that anybody is the first to innovate, I think, reveals investment in this um, individualist neoliberal academy. And beyond this, that we don't actively seek to weaponize theory for any revolutionary purpose. We're simply generating theory for its own purpose. Um, I wrote here, which is not a very nice thing, but 
I was on the plane, so forgive me. I wrote, we merely wish to show how clever we are and how many big words we understand. But, you know, I think you know what I'm saying. All right. So all of this is just to say, how did I come up with these ideas um, and with the book that I'm writing at the moment? So really, I was brought to writing uh, this book in the way that I'm writing it, which is quite different to what I set out to do originally, via engagement, more and more engagement with the work of Cedric Robinson, and particularly with discussions that I'm having with um, Kian, who I mentioned just earlier, who's become my PhD student recently, Kieran Turner, who's worked on um, direct action in Palestine solidarity movement, and more recently on racial capitalism as a theory of history. Um, we have a lot of dialogues together. And I also was um, participating in the Millennials are Killing Capitalism reading group on Black Marxism at the end of last year. And really, this, all of these kinds of opportunities were incredibly important for thinking through where I'm going. So initially what I wanted to do was to write a quick sort of essay-like response to what people have you know, come to call the war on critical race theory. That's the title of David Goldberg's new book. And he wrote an article in the Boston Review last year or two years ago now. Um, and I've kind of used that coinage because I think it's, it's a nice way of resuming what's going on. But it was actually quite interesting. So my idea was like, you know, this is going on. We need to write a quick response to it, like a short essay, like maybe 25,000, 30 words, 30,000 word essay like book, short thing. And it was actually quite difficult to get publishers interested in this. I don't know, maybe it's me, <laughs> but we don't know. But the response was particularly interesting um, that many of them, well, I didn't go to many publishers. I'm talking about two in particular who will not be named. Um, both said that they didn't think this was going to be an issue next year, right? And this was in 2021. And I was like, yeah. trust me, I've been doing this work for a really long time. I can tell you that even if the language slightly changes, it'll still be an issue because it's not actually a new issue. It's just a new way of talking about a very, very old problem, yeah? So anyway, all of that meant that it took me a while to get a contract. I did get a contract with Pluto, um, luckily. But after all of that kind of toing and froing about, you know, is this really an important issue? I kind of lost the verb for the topic as being an interesting object of study in and of itself. And I became way more interested in exploring what it can do to help um, us to understand what Cedric Robertson calls the racial regime. Uh, the racial regime uh, is a concept that he developed in his book, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning. Has anybody read that book? Highly recommend. It's a very, very interesting book. And um, when I read that book, um, I saw how the war on critical race theory lends itself perfectly to elucidating what he means by what he calls the recalibration work of the racial regime, which I'll explain in a minute. And really funnily, and I'm going to say this here because, you know, what can you do? I was thinking this, and then I, a few months later, and I was thinking, okay, this is the way, I'm, this is the direction I'm going to take with this book. And then a few months later, I heard an interview with Robin D.G. Kelly on the Conjuncture podcast. And of course, he said exactly this. He said, you know, the racial regime is the perfect way for explaining the war on critical race theory. And I was like, OK, <laughs> but at least I felt validated by the fact that I wasn't the only person thinking this, right? Um, so different people have used the racial regime. But I want to suggest that few use it in the sense that Cedric Robinson meant, bar a few people. And there are some really interesting papers and books written using, okay, the only book that I've come across that actually fully makes use of the racial regime conceptually is Brenna Bander's work, uh, book, The Colonial Lives of Property. Um, other people have picked up the concept but don't really follow through on the methodology that he proposes. But when they, um, you, when all of this work refers to racial regimes, they use, they tend to refer to the definition that Robinson provides in the introduction, which I'll read. So um, just so you know what it is. So he says, racial regimes are constructed social systems in which race is proposed as a justification for the relations of power, while necessarily articulated with the cruels of power, the covering conceit of a racial regime is a makeshift patchwork masquerading as memory and the immutable. I probably should have put this on a slide. I'm happy to share it with people later on. Um, and and people, you know, will tend to refer to this and, and quite often move on quite quickly from this. But I really wanted to sit with this, but also the rest of what he's saying in this book, right? So I actually think that there's a more important aspect to his definition 
than what you get in that de in that part of the definition, which is, as I'm saying, usually the one that's advanced. And it's where he writes, racial regimes are subsequently unstable truth systems. And you can already see that this is quite similar to the work that I was already citing before on the instability of race. But I like this idea of being an unstable truth system. There's three things going on there, right, which are quite interesting to think about together. Like Ptolemaic astronomy, he says, they may collapse under the weight of their own artifices, practices, and apparatuses. They may fragment desiccated by new realities, which discard some fragments wholly while appropriating others into newer regimes. Indeed, he says, the possibilities are the stuff of history. So this part of his explanation seems to be to me at least, to be the most important and helpful idea coming out of this notion of racial reg regime. So it, it's actually less about the social structure, which is the part that's usually picked up on. And obviously, I don't know if everybody's here is a sociologist, but generally as sociologists of race, we like to talk about structures and systems like we're comfortable in that atmosphere. We talk about social constructionism and all this kind of stuff, but actually he's much more interested in the work of production and reproduction of race, which I think is the part that we struggle to explain because we find it hard. I wrote in a part of my book, you know that thing that people say, how come it's the 21st century and we're still banging on about this stuff or it's still a problem, right? That part of how do we still have to deal with this shit, right? Is the part that we find difficult to explain. And it never seems to be sufficient to say things like, history keeps repeating itself. That always seems really glib and insufficient and just not sociological at all. So, you know, this question of why race keeps hanging around like a bad smell is something that we need to understand. What work goes into this constant building and rebuilding of race? Obviously, we can already see that this overlaps with questions introduced by Hall, Sivanandan, Wolf I mentioned earlier, and so on. But it's something that Cedric Robinson writes before this that is also of importance. He starts the book by noting the most significant tendency in race studies to infer particular origins to race. And again, I'll read out what he says. He says, this is right at the beginning of the book. And what I love about Cedric Robinson is he doesn't introduce me, he doesn't conclude, right? I mean, there is an introduction. There's actually no conclusion to this book. It just ends at the end of the last chapter. But he's like, okay, this is what I'm writing, just get with it. I'm not gonna pamper you by giving you like a lot of like, you know, lead up to this, right? Anyway, so he says, in materialist terms, the simplest rendering, in other words, of race, is that the commercial nexus of the African slave trade and the political apparatus of colonialism, the economies of securing and controlling African bodies, the sinews of patriarchy, and the trade in slave produced commodities, relations of power, eventuate in the establishment of the Negro and discourses on race. In other words, there's a movement from systems of slavery and, of, and the practices of colonialism, therefore producing race, giving us race, yeah? And he says that this view doesn't leave much room for imagining what he calls more tractable materials. In other words, how does race appear in other guises, right? If it's always about this particular lineage of history, how can we see it popping up in other, in relation to other um, issues, other bodies, other geographical locations that you name it, right? Why doesn't it also then go away after the formal abolition of slavery and the official end of colonialism? Because if it was so tightly wedded to these systems, you would think that it would wither away with the formal end of these systems. Okay, this is where we get coloniality and the afterlife of slavery and all the rest of it, but we also get a whole host of other things, right? And race, the shape-shifting ability that race has. So he writes, in its totality, this account of race production is a seductive archeology span securing revelation, elegance, and precision for the obscurity and chaos, which are a constant threat in historical research. So this totalizing narrative, as he calls it, doesn't account for different or competing relations of power, nor for resistance to power, right? This is very important, as you will know from Black Marxism, crucial to Cedric Robinson's work, there's always resistance to power, right? There's always the Maroons, there's always the, upri the slave uprising, that cannot be discounted, right? So Robinson, interestingly, partially lays the blame for this totalizing narrative at the door of our old friend, 
Michel Foucault for providing us with this neat totalizing theorization. Although at one point he says in parentheses, well, Foucault wasn't as much the adult as Edward Said said, which I thought was hilarious anyway. Um, anyway, the acceptance and extra extrapolation of this view, he says, doesn't leave room for chaos, right? Or the existence of chaos, which Robinson insists is the real condition under which race develops and continues to develop. He says, race is an alchemy of the intentional and the unintended, of known and imagined fractures of cultural forms, of relations of power, and the power of social and cultural relations. But that idea of intentional and the unintended, right? So there's always the consequences that you cannot anticipate, which is absolutely crucial, right? And explains a lot about why race is able to splinter into so many directions and why it keeps hanging around like a bat snake. So because human agency constantly radically challenges the purported naturalness of racial ordering, it tends, as he says, to wear thin over time. In other words, race and wears thin over time. This is what necessitates, he says, the constant recalibration of the racial regime. It's in response to resistance to it. And the idea that people start to see through this game, right? It's not actually very convincing to us. Racial regimes are not reconstructed, he says, wholesale. It's never exactly borrowing from the motifs of the past, but rather they borrow from these old motifs. That's why history constantly appears to be repeat, repeating, but every time it seems to be repeating, it's happening in a slightly different way. Now, there's lots more that I can say about forgeries, right, which I'm not going to say the book, but for want of time, what I basically want to say is following what I said earlier and concurring with our esteemed um, colleague, Robin D.G. Kelly, racial, the racial regime is, I think, a perfectly adapted theory for explaining the war on critical race theory. Or more interestingly, the war on critical race theory is a good lens for building on Cedric Robinson's methodology in that work, right? So actually the book project started out as, let me explain what's going on with this war on critical race theory. And actually it's become, let me use this really boring war on critical race theory to say something much more interesting about the racial regime, right? And racial capitalism. Okay, sorry, just take some more. How are we doing for time? Or we do, we okay? I think we started late. Started late. Oh, okay, that's more than fine, okay. All right, no problem. All right, so in Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, I said I wasn't going to say more about the book, but I'm going to say one, one more thing about the book. The book is actually about the arrival of the motion picture in the United States as a way of demonstrating how the racial regime is remade out of an earlier era during which the quote unquote Negro is invented for the purposes of racial capitalism. Okay. Looking at how blackness is constructed through American cinema we get a picture in the book of expanding US colonialism and imperialism in an age of fascism, the role of industrialists in building the ideological infrastructure for selling the order of things to an American and a global public, and the role of mass propaganda in securing new phases of pre and post civil rights racial capitalism. So in that book, actually what you have is a lot of detail about the invention and development of the US film industry, but actually all of that is a vehicle for demonstrating, and this is Mark Robinson's methodology, he shows but he doesn't tell, how racial regimes are recalibrated, stitching together, as he puts it, old themes in new robes, right? So it's absolutely brilliant, because on the one hand, you'll learn a lot about US cinema, but actually what you're going to learn is about colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism, right, much more. So I think this gets to an important point, which tallies with a second question that Sudeep put to me. Um, and these are not necessarily in order, sorry, by the way, which is what does it mean to think about racial capitalism as a methodology rather than as a concept, which is something I think we just spoke about um, and what I was explaining to you about how I'm conceiving of this work, yeah? The exact formulation I have to say came through discussions that we had last year in Brighton at a workshop that I co-organized with Kieran Turner on racial capitalism. So this is, was the theme of the workshop, was thinking about racial capitalism as a methodology rather than a concept. So for me, in both Black Marxism and even more so in Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, Robinson is less invested in expounding a neat theory than in pointing us in a certain direction 
so as to be able to ask more questions. As he writes at the end of the introduction to Black Marxism, and this is a brilliant quote that I think should be used by everybody in all of our work, he says, it was never my purpose to exhaust the subject, only to suggest that it was there, okay? And this is after he wrote like, a, well, before, but in the intro, you tend to write the introduction after you've written the rest of the book. So like, you know, it's like a 500 page book. And then he says, oh, I wasn't really saying anything very important. I was just trying to direct you to this, you know, to doing more work, very humble, but, and I think, but very true. So what he provides us um, more than a theory is a framework for going behind and beyond standard accounts of the history of capitalism. As he ends the book, Robinson writes that it was intended primarily as a theoretical discourse, but that this might seem surprising because it doesn't dwell in abstractions, as he puts it, but refers to historical materials. He explained that he did this for the purpose, this is a quote, for the purpose of resurrecting events that have systematically been made to vanish from our intellectual consciousness. And I thought this was so interesting because this is all, this has been the theme of my work from the outset, right? I've always been perplexed by why so much effort has been put into trying to silence or sideline race when it has had such a determining uh, impact on at least the modern era, right? And we're still living in full blown, um, you know, racialized structures. It's not possible, he said, to write new theory without also writing new history or as he put it, destructuring Western historiography. And that's why in the book, this is Black Marxism now, he foregrounds the work of Black Marxism on the one hand, but also crucially, it explains why he reads the history of European colonization and the enslavement of Africans from the position of those who fought against it and strove for their own freedom. In other words, Black and enslaved people are put, or formerly enslaved people are put at the center of his explanation of the history of history as we kind of, you know, as we know it. This is a history obviously from below or from the outside, from po the position of those who are said to be history less. But it's not only, and I think this is interesting in terms of our discussions about decolonizing and trying to change the bases of education, which are obviously really, really important. In Black Marxism, this is not just about including previously excluded voices, but it's about writing history on a different basis entirely. From the st standpoint of the damné, like the wretched of the earth, uh, it's not just that their account has been silenced or left out, but that the standard or hegemonic account of history produces bad, or let's call it wrong, or at best, if we want to be kind, partial accounts. Robinson, I think, has been wrongly dismissed as an enemy of Marxism, and there's so much bad faith about Robinson around, but anyway, um, I think this is misconstrued, and I think most people who read his work closely would agree. The reason, obviously, why the third half of the book and large parts of the first are focused on a critique of Marxism from insiders to it and communist and socialist movements and so on is because Marx and Marxists provide some of the better accounts of capitalism colonialism and imperialism. So obviously he's taking Marxism seriously, but he also wants to tell us that they are only partial because as earlier explained with regards to forgeries of memory and meaning, they rely too much on a totalizing narrative that doesn't allow for the multiple and constant challenges to power from actors from outside of those whom Marx and Marxists believe to be the agents of revolution, right? So they weren't the subjects of the revolution from the industrial working class that Marx and many Marxists presume that they would be, or Western Marxists presume that they would be. These actors from the outside or from the underside included maroons and fugitives and other rebels who were not seen as the natural revolutionary subjects. They were not organized in movements and parties or unions. They didn't have a unitary ideology and their primary motivation was getting free. So when we see history from this perspective, some certainties about the development of capitalism and race come into question. And we start to see things that don't seem to fit into standard accounts. So after engaging, or during, I should say, engaging with this work, because we're never done, <laughs> it's not like you read it, you put it aside and then you move on, right? So while engaging with this work, I was forced to reassess some of my own certainties about race, which I always considered to be primarily a modern phenomenon, 
that developed in situ within conditions of colonialism and slavery, much like the standard account that you know, Robinson critiques in the opening of forgeries, along with other work by Satnam Verdi in his, you know, developing account of racial, the history of racial capitalism, especially recommend the latest essay that he just published in Historical Materialism, like two weeks ago, um, but also Geraldine Heng, who I mentioned earlier in her book, The Invention of Race in the Middle Ages. It began to seem really insufficient to me um, and really rather arbitrary to date race, the emergence of race around 1492 and the standard kind of modernist account and the standard decolonial account. Um, and even more problematic to date it uh, with enlightenment, which is why I was telling you that that green book is not, I don't stand by it anymore. Mm -hmm. If you want a really, really good um, critique of some of the decolonial approaches to the dating of race, I highly recommend and also a relatively recent paper by Dusan Bielic in Race and Class on um, racial capitalism in Europe. It's absolutely super paper, but also Satnam Verdi and his paper does this. So applying Robinson's idea that it's through engaging with history from the perspective of the struggles of those most affected by racial power, it became necessary to look beyond standard accounts of race to tell a much longer and more meandering story of how race evolved. It began to seem silly to me to think about race as if it somehow emerged from a chrysalis at a particular time. Not, not, not that those arguments are that simplistic, right? I'm not trying to say that, but I definitely think the way I was taking it up was a bit simplistic, but I want to be self-critical. So thinking about racial capitalism methodologically rather than conceptually, excuse me, means thinking that what changes when we start to think about the history of Europe and hence the world after roughly the 14th century as formed by racial capitalism. If, as Robinson writes, the tendency that developed during European feudalism due to the expanding needs of a burgeoning capitalism was to differentiate among people rather than to homogenize, and that this had a foundational impact on the subsequent management of human difference, then what does that say about how we understand the processes that we try to make sense of as social scientists, like when we talk about race as a social construct, right? How do we complexify that? Essentially, the insight provided by Robinson helped me further to flesh out what I mean when I say that race has been made peripheral, but needs to be made central to how we understand politics, sociality, economy, and culture. The making peripheral of, peripheral of race participates in its perpetuation. So employing the twin tools of understanding the need for new histories, as Robinson puts it, and the idea of racial regimes being produced and reproduced and recalibrated, I think exposes this and makes it more amenable to being undermined and attacked. So linking, linking all of this now back to my book project, and I am going to a close quite soon. If the work being done by the war on critical race theory is to hide explicitly sometimes via book banning and course banning and all the rest of it, the functioning of the racial regime and to revert to standard historical accounts that obscure, not just the facts as they are from the perspective of the damné, but the means through which their, their accounts are concealed, then the work that we have to do is to constantly expose how these two dimensions are happening and how they are linked to each other. The methodology that Cedric Robinson employs is a triangulated one. You have the level of processes and practices and their work of structuring, sorry, structuring material conditions. Then you have the level of ideology or as he puts it, the recalibration of the racial regime. And last but not least, of course, you have the resistance against both of these levels of processes. Essentially the work of recalibration is a response always to resistance and uprising and revolution from below. And that's why in, you know, to refer to Sivanandan, race is constantly changing shape and so on because there's constantly an effort to undermine it. So therefore it has to be recalibrated in response. But the work of recalibrating the racial regime is of course very cunning and it has hundreds of years of experience on its side. The co-optation of ostensible anti-racism through various guises is key to the work of recalibration. So this too must be a focus of our analysis. So part of what I'm interested in is looking at how 
some key concepts from ostensible anti-racism are quite amenable to being captured by institutions at one level. And that's why I'm slightly, I'm always, slight, I'm very interested in the rather, I don't want to call it sudden, but the rather rapid acceptance of the need to decolonize and indigenize. Indigenize is the concept that plays out more in the Australian context. It seems rather interesting that even three years ago, there was absolutely no support for this institutionally. And now suddenly that seems to be writ large across the board, something that institutions are rushing to do. And what that conceals, particularly, you know, when I think about my university, which is, is involved in such extractive processes around land grabs and gentrification in an ongoing context of colonization, working together with the carceral industry, with the mining industry, with the finance sector to really continue to ensure and lock down the bases of colonial racial capitalism. What does that mean when at the same time we have all of this money being plowed into decolonizing and indigenizing, right? So these are the kinds of questions that I think we need to ask, but also from below on a more movement level, where obviously in cooperation with states, what does it mean when concepts like indigeneity and decoloniality become available to fascisms, like for example, the Zionists and the Hindutva movement, right? Both of whom have flocked to indigeneity on the one hand and decoloniality on the other in extremely worrying ways, right? So we also need to be alive to how our concepts can be, can be mobilized and perverted or subverted and how sometimes there's a kind of a unspoken collusion between the institutions and within which we work and these much more nefarious fascistic uh, movements and structures um, and where, where we sit on issues such as the repression of activists, um, particularly climate activists, uh, people who are trying to do things like Stop Pop City in Atlanta, like all of these kinds of movements that come to be on the wrong side of the good kind of anti-racism that our institutions can get behind, that those of us who are in the academy also do can benefit from, right? So we need to be very clear about where we sit and where, where that kind of aligns with the project of the recalibration of the racial regime, right? But at the same time, and we could discuss this later on, being very, I've been very critical of, and I continue to be critical of, this kind of wholesale of like, well, all of anti-racism is a whole neoliberal project that's wielded by, you know, what do they call them? The, um, yeah, no, what's that word? The, um, the, oh, the pro something managerial class, the, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, you know, that it's all a kind of a wicked plot by these kind of uh, neoliberal agents to undermine the true working class and all that kind of things. So we need to, you know, we there's, there's lots of lines that we need to tread, which are very, very difficult to tread because there's a lot of kind of coming at us from all these different sides, right? So that's kind of what this book, I mean, I've just given you a tiny snapshot, but that's kind of what this book is trying to do. And it's trying to do some other things as well. So I just want to leave you with one other concept and I am finishing here. One other concept that I find useful that I've added to the racial regime. And that's that of recursivity, which is another concept that I found useful for explaining how race recurs or race is recalibrated. And this is something I've taken from Robert Nichols's book, Theft is Property, which is a really, really interesting book. And he talks about the recursive nature of dispossession. And I've spoken about the recursive, using that the recursive nature of race. And the reason I like this idea is because he explains that recursivity is a process, as he talks about it as a looping procedure, where every time that you go back to the start, things are slightly altered and are made to adapt to the new conditions in which they have to, in which you can use them, right? And that process is really interesting because it helps us to explain how it's, again, it's not just history repeating, it's history being recalibrated and reused and perfected and augmented for the current purposes, which obviously makes our job of wishing to dismantle race or the part of working against race very, very difficult. Um, these reflections, which I think I'll leave you with, because I know that we don't have that long anymore, um, do dovetail with some of the other questions that you brought up that I know people are interested in, that I'm happy to take questions on. Um, one of the things that came up was, do we think, and I have touched on this, but do we think that decolonizing um, is a kind of a liberal practice and what, how would we use it in a more radical way? 
And also there were some questions about what I think about the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of working definition of anti-Semitism, which I've obviously written quite a lot about as well. So I'm happy to talk about these things. I didn't want to leave them out because I know that people were interested in those. So yeah, let me leave it there and hopefully we'll have things to discuss. I'm going to slide into your slide into the, yep. the, the summary is precarious. <laughs> Placed on a teacup. So we had one question online, I know. Okay. Uh, from Maria. It says other scholars have used the concept of counter movement mm -hmm. to explain the current war on critical race studies. Yeah. Do you reckon that the concept of counter movement yeah. is akin to the idea of racial calibration? Mm -hmm. um, not... Yeah, I know I get it. Do you want to come back to some questions or do you want me to talk about no, it? Fine, I think. Yeah. Okay, so actually, yeah, I didn't talk about this, but I, I do use the concept of counterinsurgency to talk about the war on critical race theory. And I think it's important because if we understand very much, I think we have to understand this as, and I didn't speak about this because I didn't have time, but what I think the bottom line is, if you want the conclusion <laughs> to yeah. where I'm going with this, but I think that the so-called war on critical race theory is an attack on black thought I, and black struggle, right? And the two being interlinked, I don't think you can just disentangle one from the other. And I think once we understand that, then we understand that this is a counterinsurgent process, right? Um, it's it's something that becomes in the current conjuncture it comes to a head in the aftermath of the 2020 global black lives matter uprisings and there's a reason for that and historically when you trace similar kinds of reactions that have held education the sphere of education in its sights very often it comes on the back of a reaction to black indigenous and people of color struggle right and that's i mean it doesn't it's not a very interesting point in and of itself i think everybody here would recognize that but I do think it's important to say, because of the tendency that you see on the left to talk about this in the terminology of the cultural wars, okay? I actually think the cultural wars is an extremely nefarious um, framing. Nefarious is my favorite word, but I overuse it, but I really like it. Uh, I don't know why I started using that word so much. Anyway, it is, it's not a good way of thinking about this, obviously because it sets it up as two sides, but it also completely empties of content what this kind, what, what is actually going on and moves us away from mm -hmm. really understanding the degree to which there is an enormous investment in discrediting um, this view on history, which would necessitate an entire, not just a tinkering around at the edges with including different narratives, but an entire rehaul or overhaul of the very bases of, of doing the doing of history, so the, epist the epistemology of history, the, the way, which means really thinking anew how we understand why we are in the predicament that we are in today after whatever number of centuries and whatever, wherever you want to date race, right? And we can have a debate about that. It doesn't really, really matter. And the effort to sideline this analytics in order to understand um the you know the course of history and the reasons for why again we are still mired in racial practices processes and structures is part of the effort to ensure that race can constantly be available for use as a key technology of power again for the management of human difference and the dehumanization of the mass of the world right so there is so much more we could say about that but i think understanding this basic fact is absolutely crucial and discursively the practice of dismissing this as either a moral panic and i'm not saying moral panic is a useful analytic that of course has been so useful to to so many of us but i do think it's been unmoored from its theoretical origins and kind of used glibly in a way that doesn't really explain very much particularly when put together with this other terminology of the cultural wars Thanks. And the reason I'm going for the online things is that we've got a lineup for the second half. Yeah. So I'm going to prioritize those. Um, so another question is coming from Kavita, which is to what extent 
could we cover this to some extent? To mm. what extent are scholars, theorists, complicit in the appropriation of the language of decolonizing mm. and related concepts? And importantly, how can we resist this? You know, this constant yeah. co-option of the next word and so mm. it's kind of sometimes vacated in meaning. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Okay. There's, there seems to be a confusion overlap between decolonizing and anti racism. Mm. Yeah. At least in the UK context. How can we delineate the two but also create meaningful links? Do you think so? And is the decolonizing perhaps more palatable and easier to be appropriated by institutions? Mm of power as opposed to anti-racism and all critical race theory. Yeah. So a couple of sort of linked questions yeah. there. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So I wonder what you said about some North American business um, yeah. activists and their separation of anti-racism from decolonization. So decolonization yeah. and sovereignty. Yeah, yeah. around land. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just do I mean, on one level, I'm obviously across, and um, you know, those those questions. On one level, I think that we need to, I need from my position now, so particularly as somebody who is um, a settler on Indigenous land, I live in uh, so-called Australia, Gadigal Wangal land, I need to tread carefully around those questions because I do understand um, a lot of the critiques. But I think that people who are engaged in, sorry, sorry. didn't hear. Maybe I'll summarize the question. Yeah, yeah sure. The room yeah, so the, the question in, in the room was about, um, you know, the kind of tensions between decolonization struggles of indigenous people in North America and anti-racism, which is seen by some uh, indigenous activists as being um, more focused on black politics. And as you put it in your question, um, that is seen as, so black people in the US are seen as or in, in North America and Turtle Island, they're seen as being part of a colonizing force. And that's where I suppose there's a possible tension. I, I know that people make this critique, but I think that people who are involved in more radical movements that put questions of land, sovereignty, and reparations at their core would be more resistant to um, siloing these two groups. Um, I think there's a collective critique that will come from radical indigenous struggles and radical black struggles and other people obviously in alliance against the kind of more professionalized diversity equity and inclusion neoliberal capture of anti-racism and decoloniality or decolonizing initiatives um, and i think that by centering an abolitionist politics which obviously has to yeah. not just think about the carceral system but also has to think about colonial racial capitalism and the state writ large, right? That that's where you find those interesting resistances also to these certainties around, you know, the divisions among and between black people and indigenous people and other people in solidarity or who are, you know, negatively racialized in other kinds of ways. So, but I I still, I mean, there's interesting work, for example, by Kehalani Kalmui on this. So she's a Hawaiian indigenous um, scholar who has written interestingly, for example, she's got a very interesting and challenging provocative paper on Afro-pessimism, which does, you know, <laughs> raise some of these questions. And I think there's a lot to discuss there. Um, but I do think that sometimes that work responds to do we want to call them elite academic discourses that don't always speak to the heart of concerns? So, you know, say, let's say the people who are resisting in the trees against Cop City, right? I don't think they're having these kinds. I don't know. I'm not there, but I don't, from what I read, I don't think they're having those kinds of conversations because I think a lot of these things have been worked out because of the urgency of the moment, right? Because you're both defending the land and you're resisting the building of this gigantic police precinct, right? So obviously what they would say is that you can't think one without the other thing, right? Like how can you talk about, you know, the resistance to 
incarceration in the absence of thinking about where those prisons are built, right? So, and the need to, you know, re constantly colonize land in order to make this, these, 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 you know, structures possible. Um, at, yeah, so I think we need to be guided by that kind of struggle. I'm sure you would agree. Um, so that leads us on to the other question about, well, the two other questions that kind of go together, decolonizing and anti-racism. I think to a certain extent, I may have answered that in that last answer, but I want to also say that, you know, all of these, these are words, right? They're just words and they have competing um, uh, definitions depending on where you come from. I mean, to tell a little bit of an anecdote about this that helps illustrate what I mean. When I was doing my PhD in the olden days, in um, like around the year 2000, uh, I, I, I did it in Florence at the European University Institute and I did, you know, interviews with anti-racist movements in different countries and so on. And a, student, a new student came from France and she was like, oh, what are you studying? And I was like, oh, I'm studying anti-racist movement. And her face just went like, like white. She was like in shock. And I was like, what's wrong? And she was like, oh my God, like, so are you like one of those kind of like totally state co-opted kind of, you know, people? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because for her in the French context in the early 2000s, anti-racism was a word that had so, so perfectly been captured by the socialist party and it's kind of, you know, it's co-optation of the SOS racism movement and all that kind of history going back to the 1980s, that there was no way to use this language in a way that wasn't connected to a state top-down project that was anti-Black, was anti-Palestinian, was anti-Muslim, it was everything that we know it to be, right? But what's interesting is that with the, um, in 2005, with the birth of the movement of the indigenous of the Republic in, in France, right? You had this development of, by Huria Boutadjan, other people, of moral anti-racism versus political anti-racism, right? So that's how they, they show that there are different ways of conceiving of anti-racism, but that language wasn't there then, right? So I had to do a lot of work to show her that, actually, no, we have a completely different way of understanding anti-racism, right? So in, in other words, these are just words and the content has to be fleshed out by us. So of course, you know, I don't think we need to, I, I wouldn't sit here and say, oh, I'm opposed to decolonization of the curriculum, let's say, because it's always, susceptible to co-optation, I still want the curriculum to be more appropriate for the kinds of teaching that we need to do across all subjects, right? On Monday, I'm going down to Tooting to St. George's Hospital to talk to a group in, in, in neuroscience, neuropsychology, who are wanting to decolonize their curriculum in neuropsychology, right? So that's great. I think it's fantastic, right? And I, I actually think that it's fantastic that institutions have money for doing this. But we just have to be alive to the fact that this is always open to co-optation and that part of the agenda of the institutions within which we work is to, they can't completely deny our struggles, but they can dilute them to an extent where they become manageable, right? So in our role within all of that is to, to decide where we can sit comfortably with regards to that. And that's very difficult. I mean, it's not, I don't have any moral lessons on how we can do that. Yeah, okay. one. Oh, it's somebody else online. Um, Kenny had a question uh, about Alex de Bonnet's book, Multi Racism. Which I haven't read yet. Oh, you haven't read Sorry, it. Penny. Okay. But does she want to say something about, about it? Her question was she was wondering if you've read it incorrectly mm -hmm. and whether his work supports the notion of the situation. No, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah supports this notion of the situating of racism not in one historical or geographical location. Mm, yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on his work? But... Well, I want to read it yeah. before commenting, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I will say one thing that I think, I, I think that Robinson's account of race as being a European civilizational project is very important. And I don't want to lose sight of the Eurocentricity of race, even while understanding that it has a more, a longer and more meandering process of elaboration than I, for one, have given it credit for in the past. So maybe I would differ from Bonnet. And I know that, for example, you know, um, Valu in his, um, in his uh, critique of my book in the Ethic and Racial Studies Symposium made a really important point about whiteness. In my definition of race, he was wondering to what extent white supremacy is really the objective of race when you have the ability, you have race being developed in so many uh, racisms of various of various kinds 
being developed in so many other contexts that are not quote unquote white contexts. And he was thinking of India, Sri Lanka, and other places like that, for example. And I think this is really important work to do, but I'm not sure that I want to lose sight. I don't want to generalize and universalize race to the extent that we can't locate it in any kind of particular trajectory. I just personally don't think that is particularly useful while at the same time recognizing the overlaps and the codependencies of race in these different contexts. But that probably, that work needs to be done by people who are specialists of those places that I am less okay with. Like I'm European, I can critique Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a question that came in from Shahir, it's um, relatively long, but I'll just read out what he's written. Thanks for the talk. Influenced by South analytical thought, I've always struggled with the foundational understanding of race, racism, and experience, mm. and recalibrating accordingly. When we know that there are limits to the human experience and experience itself. And yet I'm convinced racialized difference is crucial to such understanding. And so I wonder how you negotiate this dimension of yeah. race's empty signifier. Yeah, that's a complex question. I yeah. think I understand what he's trying to say. Did everybody hear what he just said? Okay, I'll try to summarize a little yeah. bit. So with it'll I won't do justice to the question. It's quite a complex question, but he's trying to talk about he's he's not trying. I'm trying to interpret what he's saying, or he or she is yeah. saying, that um they they they're talking about the fact that, that thinking about race through experience is insufficient, but at the same time that where you sit like how you're racialized will impact how you understand race. I think that's what they're trying to say. Yeah. And I think this is actually really important, right? So when um, in the in my discussion, in the second chapter of the book that I'm writing, I'm discussing, um, you know, the work of history, relating it to some of the things that I was talking about today. And I think one of the things that we need to contend with is where you are located ontologically will have and always an impact on how you understand a particular context, right? You can't, there's no such, I mean, I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know, but there's no such thing as objectivity. And I think the denial of that is something that's fundamental to a Eurocentric epistemology. And it's been at the heart of, part of the reason why we've been unable to contend with race, because either race is universalized out of existence, or it's considered to be a non-serious, you know, analytic that should just be gotten rid of because it's metaphysical, it doesn't have any bases in kind of structures of power and so on. And my belief is that the assertion of this plays into its perpetuation, right? So by constantly denying something, you actually allow it mm -hmm. to take on other guises and become more forceful, right? So so I think where you, where you are located ontologically is incredibly important for how you understand something. But at the same time, I don't think that necessarily having an experience of something on an everyday basis gives you the analytical tools to be able to necessarily situate it intellectually, right? And I so therefore, I think people's experience needs to sit with a kind of, um, within an analytical framework. And this is where the work of like, what we've been calling racial literacy after people like Lani Guinier and Franz Linden Klein becomes very important. And a lot of people, have, I've spoken about this in a number of interviews, because a lot of people have kind of, um, I think, willfully misinterpreted what is meant by racial literacy. So they'll say things like, oh, you think the people are stupid and they need to be taught by you who's much more clever or something like that. And I'm like, or the other interpretation is like, oh, we need to teach white people how to be less racist. Like, none of this interests me in the least, right? But there's a very basic thing that Franz Linden Klein says in her work on um, white parents of black children, right? Um, which is a whole other area that we could discuss. I mean, the, anyway, let's leave that aside. But the one thing that she says about that, which I think is really, really interesting and important, is that people need the analytical tools to be able to make sense of their own reality, right? You can't just walk out into the world and like have these experiences and then go, yes, I've understood everything, right? On the contrary, right? Mm -hmm. Racism is going to create havoc for you as a person when you experience it. Like most people in the room have had these experiences and it's confusing. Like let's say 
a little child, like I can tell, like even what happened to my daughter from when she was like, like a little child, her best friend tells her, you can't play Elsa because you're not blonde, you know, because you're Indian, you can't play Elsa. So, you know, to a young age, you have this happening to you, Elsa from Frozen, by the way, because mm. I don't know who I'm talking about. I'm still traumatized by Elsa from Frozen. Anyway, <laughs> but, you know, so right from the age of four, you have somebody else telling you. And then <laughs> to continue with the anecdote, after um, a complaint went to the parents by the nursery teachers, the father comes to me and he goes, look, I've spoken to my child and I've explained this all to her. I'm really sorry. I've told her, you know, it's fine. You, little whatever her name was, you have English blood and mom has Indian blood. And I'm going, what the hell? So already at this age, right, they're being exposed to this kind of racializing. Now, how is a four-year-old supposed to use that experience? How is she supposed to make sense of that experience unless her parents and her peers and her teachers, or her peers, her teachers and her, her parents are going to give her the tools to understand that. And very often what we know is that the teacher will say things like, oh, they didn't mean it, or, or they're saying, oh, that's mean, or, you know, something like they don't explain, well, you know, what we're dealing here with like is a structure of power in which certain kinds of aesthetics are considered valuable and others aren't and it's for this this and this reason right it's and that's unfortunately the work as you all know you have to do right from a very young age with with children so that's what Wyndon's Klein brings forth in her in her work which I think is very valuable an explanation of the fact that you need the tools to make sense of your experience right and so that's why experience on its own so when we talk about and, you know, Olufemi Taiwo's work on this, on his critique of standpoint, um, or his, his, his explanation of how standpoint epistemology has been misused. So we'll just revert to someone who looks a certain way or who comes from X community and they can be the expert of a certain subject, even though maybe because, maybe because of their class positioning or their location, whatever, they actually don't have a particularly good understanding of what it means to experience this because they haven't had this experience and so on. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, last two questions. Mm -hmm. One came in, she visited a research center dedicated to ethics, migration and anti-racism. Mm -hmm. However, they treated her with a lack of care and empathy after a racist attack mm -hmm. within their workshop. What are your thoughts on white researchers who research on people of color and their communities just so they can sort of step, move on in their career? Do you have any advice for researchers of color like myself mm -hmm. who have who have to enter these spaces mm. but also risk facing harm? Mm. Well, firstly, I'm very angry on your behalf that that happened to you because I think it's appalling but much too common. And secondly, I think, and you know, I might be controversial in saying this, but I actually don't think that anybody should do research on communities. Like, I just don't think that it's something that we should do unless you come from that community or have an extremely close relationship with them. I really object to that kind of research. Oh, there's a lot of interest in Muslims living in X suburb of blah, blah. And there's this pot of money that I could go for. And I've actually never spoken to people in this community, but because I used to do research on X community who live in a completely other place, and they're also racialized in some kind of way, I'll just cover up this money and do this research. I really think that is extremely dangerous and I think it should not be allowed if I had any, I don't get any research funding, so I can say this, I, you know, nobody ever gives me any money to do any research. So that's fine. But also I would never and have never done that kind of research. I've always researched up, right? And I think, um, yeah, that's what I think about that. Okay, just the last couple, I just read out a couple of comments questions. Uh, re whiteness and racialization in the colonization of Ireland mm. and how it impacted subsequent tactics used mm -hmm. in British colonialism on other continents. Do we need to say anti black racism? I think she's saying that maybe there's anti white. Oh, do we need to talk about other kinds of I like, so. do we need to specify anti blackness? Islamophobia, anti Semitism, yeah. etc., anti Irish racism, I yeah. suppose she's talking about. Um, she's well, raised the thing about the colonization of Ireland. Yeah. So. I mean, I think, I mean, historically, we have to understand that a lot of, a, a lot of the context for working out um, racial technologies or technologies of racial and colonial power were worked out in the Irish context by the British. And, you know, I think, um, not enough work has been done on making those historical linkages. I'm not sure exactly what the questioner thinks about this, and it would be quite interesting to hear what they have to say. Um, I'm 
I think it's very important to understand how racisms play out differently for different people who are racialized and in different contexts and at different times. However, at the same time, politically, from the perspective of struggle, I think it's always vital to show how these different processes and practices of racialization and racism are co-constitutive. So they depend on each other in very, very particular ways, not always in the same ways, right? So sometimes they're articulated in very, so for example, I think Islamophobia and antisemitism are articulated in a very specific way. And that has also evolved and could evolve again, right? Um, I think, you know, Fanon has talked about the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Blackness. But I think just generally, it's useful for us to think about race as a totalizing, okay, now I'm using that language that Robinson resists, but hmm. it's a project that has different tentacles, right? It's not something that can be confined to, um, you know, it doesn't originate with one particular practice and then morph into other practices. It's rather these different things are happening at not necessarily concurrently historically, but after the development of racial technologies and racial ideologies, the different practices of racial rule depend on each other. And there are reasons why at times certain groups appear to be more favored than others and why this moves and morphs, right? There are reasons for that. And that's to do with how power is constantly in this process of calibration and recalibration. And our job, I think, is to not succumb to the efforts to divide us and rather to work very, very carefully, both to recognize where the harms are most urgent in the current time, but also never to lose sight of the fact that these, that you know that the enactment of racism is predicated on on these concurrent processes. I don't know if that's clear, but I'm I'm basically asking for more relationality in how we think about anti-racism. Okay, can you do one more? Yeah. So Nabila is asking on racial capitalism as a methodology. One of the things that I find very difficult to do often is to look at phenomena that are quite obviously related to racism and colonialism in the archive. Okay. But it's much harder to directly connect them to capital accumulation. Any thoughts on how to deal with this problem of the archive? Mm. My work is on migrant and refugee detention. Mm. I mean, I don't know exactly what, what she's talking about, so how to link them to capital accumulation. I presume, and I'm really reading between, between the lines now, is what she wants to say is that, for example, with migrant detention, there are always capitalist interests in play, not least with the privatization of migrant detention um, and so on and so forth, but that sometimes we focus more on harms done to individuals within those types of carceral systems and we lose sight of the the nexus of of you know accumulation that those that those were all kind of existing in, but at the same time, I think it's important not to fall into the trap of saying, well, this is just about capital accumulation, and the dehumanization is secondary. And this is where I think that's where the perspective of racial capitalism really helps us because we can't disentangle these two things. Because the phenomenon that I've noted, and this is interesting to have a discussion about, you know, that issue of historical materialism that I mentioned where Satman Verdi has a really, really excellent paper, and there are some other really excellent papers in there, but the overall drive that's kind of set up in the introduction is one that actually is very resistant to Robinson's theorization of racial capitalism and really wants to keep racism and capitalism as two separate dynamics that become entangled for very specific reasons. So in other words, that quite classical Marxist approach to say that racism is used as a structure of, of justification or, a, or an ideology of justification in order to of the real agenda, which is capitalist accumulation, right? And, you know, I think my perspective very close to Robinson would be actually you don't get one without the other because if the logic is to differentiate, then um, that's what becomes that mechanism of racial differentiation is what is used to be able to globalize capitalism and to enact these processes um, or these practices of dehumanization that then capitalism relies on 
to be able to expand and to reproduce itself. And that's why, you know, in the Dusan Bielik paper, it's so important. He says, you know, slavery as a practice comes back again and again. So the way in which migrants in Europe, and this is what he's talking about in the paper, are exploited today is not entirely separate from slavery. In other words, we need to go back to the European origins of slavery to understand the purpose of the migrant today in Europe for the constant growth of capitalism, which is not a perspective that you often hear about, because either we get to hear about migrants as kind of abjected subjects that need our help and support, or we get them as the criminals and you know people who are marauders and who have to be kept at bay or imprisoned and so on. But we rarely get to think about the migrant as essential for the continuing primacy of European dominance, like capitalist dominance. And that question, that those questions that he opens up in that and that paper, I think, are intensely useful. So maybe actually reading that paper would help in the, the question. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think we've worked you quite hard for <laughs> well over an hour and a half. So. Um, Oh yeah, please. Yeah. 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 But also I want people to have a chance to ask questions about their own research. So that if you have a question that's just about something that I've said that you disagree with or you want to say more about, then we can do because you had a question with Brian earlier. Did you want to ask it? If you want. Yes, yeah, I wrote Impossible. It's not even about aligning with global struggles around the world. It's also looking at, you know, the practices of universities in the arms industry, in carcerality, like often working together with the police um, and the prison system and the criminal injustice system in very direct ways that bring huge amounts of funds to universities and on which universities are dependent. You know, something that I was involved in a number of years ago, which was the investment. So in, in Australia, it's it's mandatory to have a pension fund. It's called superannuation fund, right? You can't, it's not optional like it is in other places. So our university superannuation fund was invested in mandatory detention. So those islands that everybody's heard of, Nauru and Manus Island, where people were, you know, imprisoned for years and years, um, asylum seekers. The company that ran that was, um, our superannuation fund was invested in it. And part of our campaign was to try to get the union to drive a, you know, to, to force the superannuation company to divest from, but there was absolutely no interest in it because people were saying, well, what about our retirement funds, right? So we're all really, really invested in these structures and systems. And other kinds of practices, you know, like think about international students and the way they're exploited by the system here and elsewhere. Um, the collusion between universities and something you know well about the prevents agenda and you know you we don't need to tell you about all of this and you can tell us but I mean it, you know that that's the point and so then we might want to be very cynical when we see the current pivot to decolonizing and think well what actually is this masking and if I want to be fair I think that the people who drive these initiatives it's not that they're involved in some kind of plot, right? They actually believe in these things. And I think like in my own university where up, up until recently, there was absolutely no talk of indigenous studies. It was very, very marginal in the university. And in the last three to four years, we have a new um, uh, senior man part of the senior management who are all indigenous. Um, they've managed to bring in um, $50,000 a year scholarships for Indigenous PhD students. Um, they've instituted all kinds of programs across the university, and now it's become mandatory 
for every single course to indigenize its curriculum. Great, fantastic. I'm 150% behind this. The problem is that there's actually no basis for a conversation about the kinds of things that I've just been speaking about, right? And I'm not saying that the individuals don't agree with me. I think they would agree with me, but they have a very pragmatic approach. They have a kind of a trickle down approach. So they believe that if there are enough people at the top, then the benefits will trickle down. And literally, maybe I shouldn't say this on a recording, but you know, you can imagine to yourself the kind of thing. It's very much about, you know, let's call it, you know, that kind of framework of black excellence that people talk about, right? And that has its problems because then we get things like, you know, the kinds of things that feminists have been, black feminists, particularly in the US and other places have been talking about, like, you know, do we need just prisons for women and non-binary people that are nicer, you know, and have yoga rooms and things like that? You know, you do, I'm not saying that that's what my colleagues are talking about, I'm not trying to say that, but you can understand where you can go, right? When you haven't really interrogated what decolonization means. And in the context of where I work, decolonization means land back and reparations and self-determination for indigenous people on their own land. And it really doesn't mean anything else. Everything else is fluff, even though it obviously creates a better learning experience for students of color. So that's the, the trade-off. Okay, thanks very much. And um, we'll have a bit of a break now and come back to the second half. Thanks to everyone online. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody online. Thanks for coming.